introduced everyone, but they were all seated and dispersed, so I'll uh, point them out. Although you probably now know all three of the people here from the film. We have A.D. Coleman here. Go ahead, he said to me. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> really nice that everybody came out. It's been very um, inspiring to see this crowd, and I want to thank the people here at the Cove Street Arts. What a marvelous, isn't this a marvelous space? Yeah. 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 It's like a, a rebirth, I don't know if it's a rebirth, but the porcelain arts uh, energy that's happening through this place just seems amazing. Um, I'm not sure why I'm speaking first, but I took it away. Um, these two people over here are just amazing. Um, David is like Harold's oldest friend in the world. You would always know when David and Harold were talking on the phone because it was cutting up all the time. It was like Mutt and Jeff. It was like, I said, that's gotta be David on the phone. Just constant laughter, um, decades of deep friendship, and, um, and David was the only person that Harold ever allowed to print for him while he was still printing, still printing. And uh, David is a superb printer. Because um, of Harold. What? Because of Harold. Because of Harold. <laughs> And I just, I want to take this opportunity too to mention, if I may, because many of you, most of you are from Portland, and you're, a lot of you are David's friends. I have four marvelous friends from Newburyport who came, one of whom also printed for Harold late in his life, Matt Shank, please stand up, who's in the film. Yay. And his wife, Kathleen, who's also here. And Jeremy and Arlene Barnard. Jeremy was, is, not was, is a photographer who also was, uh, had an opening here when Cove Street Arts opened. So his work was hanging here. And the four of them came up from Newburyport, which was very lovely. And this man over here, Alan Coleman, who uh, is not only, um, you know, really the godfather of photo criticism internationally in the world, we would say, it's true. Maybe the, maybe the father, not the godfather. Okay. Not, not those implications, please. <laughs> we started photo criticism as a let me, form. Let me give you a critique you can't refuse. <laughs> and when I was really trying to help Harold get himself out there later in his life, one of the first meetings we had was with Alan in New York who really helped to give us a jump start in certain ways and guiding us and how to really begin that renaissance of Harold's work. That's all I'm going to say right now. These two guys are great. Do you have questions that you want to ask to anybody? And please do, if you do. Or me, even. You're too old to be shy. <laughs> most of, most of you. <laughs> ah, questions, questions. <laughs> Comments, questions. So did he continue photographing in black and white all the way? I noticed the switch to color with the, with the books that were so popular, but was he continuing to work in black and white? Uh, occasionally. But the thing, the reason he moved from sort of small camera street work was that he was not very mobile at the end of his life. And so he was able to do the other work in the studio, the color work in the studio, much more easily. But when Andy took him back down to Coney Island, he, that was the last thing you saw there. He had his small camera with him and he was uh, moving around doing some and we have some some black and white from the 2000s onward mm -hmm. but mostly it was in color at that point i saw a question over there yeah um, i couldn't tell from the credits but just curious if he did a lot of motion uh movie work too was any of that footage his motion movie oh. footage or was he strictly stills andy's you mean the B-roll, the, 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 the stuff on the street, or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was the filmmaker. That was Andy Dunn. Yeah. yeah. I was really 
struck by the, um, the, the part of the film where he talked about the format of the camera that he, the, the camera that he got was a square format where he was looking through, what was the name, what camera was that? Roll Roll yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I was just really struck by how that um, was so inspirational and um, also thought immediately about the, you know, the, the rage of Instagram and how it's square and maybe that's why it's so enticing to us non-photographers because it immediately crops this beautiful frame mm -hmm. and so I, I just think it's so wonderful to see it, you know, in its original format, mm -hmm. probably what it was inspired by. Well, another aspect of that, it's a good, good point to raise, and another aspect of that is that when you work with a, a it's called the twin lens reflex, right, because there's, there's a viewfinder and then there's the, you know, uh, you, you see it on the front of the camera, you see these two lenses. Um, when you work with that camera, you hold it at, usually, you normally hold it at stomach height, at belly yeah, height, and you look, you're looking down at a viewfinder. And what that means is, for example, in Harold's pictures of kids, that the camera is at their eye level. Uh -huh. So he's not looking down at the, in most cases, there are pictures where he is with a 35 millimeter. In most cases, a lot of the pictures that, in the section about his pictures of children, he's, he's looking at them at their eye level, which has an equalizing effect, right? It's not an adult looking down with that sense of power. It's, it's somebody, it's really somebody looking at them, although they may not understand that, through the, through the camera. So it, it has an effect on the way you photograph and on the way people respond to you when you photograph. It was mentioned in the film that he works fast, which is what street photographers do. But also, I'm interested in, could you describe the instantaneous way in which he made a connection so he could get the intimacy of working fast? Is it just, can you put that into words for us? I'm <laughs> I've been with Harold a few times when he was photographing, and for some reason they just let him in. You know, I mean, what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that he could be in front of one person, five people, whatever, and so, if this is what you're asking, and they just allowed him in to to photograph. I mean, it, it just like you saw Coney Island, the stuff that was being shot at Coney Island way back. You know, these people, these young people, the Primarily the young people. And yeah. it must happen in seconds rather than... Well, Robert, Capo, Robert Capo once gave the advice to photographers, like people and let them know it. Yeah, right? yeah. And for a certain kind of photographer who has that personality, that's, that's really it. You know, if, you, if you engage with people, then that happens. But every photographer has his or her own personality. And that's reflected in the images. And there are photographers who are aggressive and they get pictures that are responses to their aggression. And there are photographers who disappear completely. Uh, I, there, there was a photographer who worked with Margaret Mead quite a bit named Ken Heyman. He, uh, he published a book with her called uh, The Family of Children, I think. I can't, a number of, number of projects with Margaret Mead and other projects also. And he was a big guy. Ken was something like six foot eight or something like that. And big, I mean heavy, stocky guy, right? And he always had about eight cameras around his neck. And, uh, and I, I, I never got to see him photograph, but I talked to people, photographers who saw him photograph, and they said Ken would disappear. Ken came into a room and Eight seconds, ten seconds, he was invisible. Now, how a, ten, you know, a six foot eight, 200 pound guy with eight cameras becomes invisible, I don't know, right? But some people have that ability, and therefore they're not, they don't make the people they're photographing self conscious. And other photographers very actively make those people self conscious, and some photographers inadvertently make them self conscious, make people self conscious, right? So it's, well, there's, 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 a, no, there's no one answer to your question. It's, 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 a, it's the personality issue with the photographer. In the film you see Harold's son saying he had the face. If you met this man, he had a, he had a face to remember. It was welcoming, it was radiant, he was always smiling. Like from and here to here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there is a, a French curator now who's working on a touring exhibition named Francois Chabot. He came to the studio for three days. He said, what I love about these photographs is he 
engaged the person in the creation of the photograph. It's participatory. Mm -hmm. So everything you see, people are particip participating willingly in the construction of the, of the photograph. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that was the nature of this man. This man was warm, he was welcoming. So he was completely non-threatening and people loved to participate with, yeah. you know, with where he was, with yeah. his happiness and joy. And see, for me, um, I always stand away from people when I'm photographing, primarily, because I'm afraid they're going to hit me. <laughs> and, uh, and just like, it's really strange, but that's what I feel. And here's Harold putting his head right in there, you know? But and even he, with Harold, that isn't always true. There's one picture that you see very briefly a couple of times in the film of a, of a little black child sitting on the asphalt of a playground writing numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And he has clearly been disturbed by this large white guy standing <laughs> over him, photographing him, and he's looking up very, very suspiciously <laughs> at this man, right? Um, yeah. So, so you know, even, even someone like Harold can evoke other things from some people in some situations. It's marvelous film because you can't instantly see the picture. So, you get, you get, you get, you get, can I see myself? You right, know, right. That. It has to be in a relationship that comes memory. Well, you know, so interesting with, with digital now, if you're photographing somebody, you can show them instantaneously, yeah. you'll see what, yeah. you know, I mean, when I'm in Cuba photography, if I shoot somebody from afar, I won't, normally I won't go up close, and they look at me like, what are you doing? You know, and I'll go up and I'll show them the image of themselves, and then suddenly their eyes open up and they're like, wow, you know, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's magic to them. It really is. And that's one of the great things about digital is that you have instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And you can also go, you know, click, 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 click as many times as you want. And then you can edit instantaneously if you wanted to. I mean, it's just really, things have really changed yeah. um, in a good and bad way. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, one of the things that just struck me was just the openness of his face and the love in his eyes and his smile. And and what struck me is as he goes through his career, when digital comes along, he seems open to that. When scanners come along, he seems open to that. Yeah. Is that something that came easily to you as a photographer to change from being a great printer to a, a great developer? Or whatever, to a digital, digital for me was, was very, very difficult to switch over to. Because I, I did film for years and years and then one of the trips to Cuba, I've been going for 20 years, um, every year, and probably, I don't know, 12, 14 years ago, um, when I was coming back, uh, after spending time there photographing, um, you go through customs there. You know, they, throw, they put you through the, the machines and what have you. And they've always been very good up until that point about respecting the fact that you have film, you, you know, so I, I would have it in a lead bag and they'd say to me, well, you know, what's in there? So I'd show them the film and, they'd, and I'd say, please do not run it through unless it's in the bag. That was fine. And then this one year, you know, he just said, you know, fuck you. And he, he dumped it and just threw it right through. You know, I came back and my film was all streaked. And that's when I decided I have to switch to digital. You know, it's a hard thing for me to do, you know. I mean, even now, I shoot primarily, I shoot all digital now. And, you know, I, it's amazing what it does. You know, the quality, everything is pretty amazing. But when I compare um, a film print to a digital print, uh, on paper, the paper feels like silk to me, where a uh, digital print feels more like wool. That's how I compare them. Move to sell. And I print on beautiful paper, you know, but it, it just, it's very different to me. And I still think about it all the time. So, I don't know. Right. Way in the back. He wasn't scanning negatives. He was using the scanner as a camera. Okay, but then after that, we went back to Coney Island. 
Oh. That was film. Uh -huh. That was analog. Right. So he never yeah. No, he didn't. You're right. Yeah. He didn't. Well, he, I mean, he did occasionally use a digital camera, mm -hmm. but mostly, most of his digital work was actually scenography. Yeah. He wouldn't tell anybody at the time. Right. Yeah. He would I, just say, "Oh, it's you know, it was photographed." Yeah. I, I, I wrote I wrote the introduction to the first book, One Hundred Flowers, and part of what I try to do always when I do that kind of, kind of uh, uh, appreciation of somebody's work for monograph is I try to explore and explain to the, to the reader of the book how those pictures got made. And Harold was so elliptical, I mean, I, I certainly didn't figure it out. I didn't know it till, till later on. This is before I got to know Harold and, uh, and, and Judith. But uh, no, he, he kept that a very closely guarded Secret, and he's not the only one who has done that, by the way. I, I, I should add, but but he he was one of the first, and certainly the first one to get that level of breakthrough with with that kind of work. But no, he he didn't want anybody to know. I don't know why, frankly. Um, did he afraid he was going to get imitated? I, I, I'm not I'm not sure. Did, did think he think people a... would think it was too easy? Uh, it really wasn't because he worked, certainly I would say probably as hard in, in fine-tuning those scans and, and the prints thereof as he worked in fine-tuning his, his, uh, his black and white negatives in the dark room. It's interesting because the first person he told was you. Is that no, right? You know, I didn't know that. When you came, well, you knew probably. Yeah, he would, he would hey, like, you, know, you better not say anything yeah. if you do, you know. Yeah. But when you came up, one of those weekends when you were working on what you were working on, right. yeah. uh, I think Carol came to me and said, I think I'm going to tell Alan. <laughs> I said, I, said well, I think you should. I'm, I'm honored. In that case, I'm, I'm really honored. Oh, so, uh, uh, gosh. Anyway, yeah. funny. Although I, I probably, at that point, we were working on a retrospective of his black and white work that never actually materialized. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I, at that point, I knew him well enough. I would have pushed him. I wouldn't just yeah. have. You wouldn't have gone I, out, I, I that just house without gone out of there with, 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 uh, <laughs> without knowing. But I'm, I'm glad that he chose to tell me. Yeah. That's very sweet. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the experience of being part of the making of this film, and mm -hmm. in some ways, it seems like a very intimate story. And I'm wondering if there are parts of it that were hard for you, or parts that you wish had been told a little bit differently? Mm, hmm. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah. So just to set, maybe and try to be very short how this film got made. Um, you saw towards the end of the film, Jason Landry talked about getting a first book made, a Kickstarter project that he helped put together, the retrospective. And somebody had emailed Andy Dunn, who's a British filmmaker, works with the BBC, said, I think you're gonna like this photography and this, you know, look at this Kickstarter campaign. So Andy c contributed, and then when he got his book in the mail, he contacted us. And I was at that point pretty much taking the emails and doing that. And he said, I'm sure you have so many people wanting to do a documentary about <laughs> Harold Feinstein. <laughs> But I really would be interested, can you let me know? That's very British, by the very way. British. So, of course, I got back to him and said, well, actually, no, we don't have a lot of people wanting to do a documentary. Only a few. Right. Yeah, you get in line and we'll, um, but what do you have in mind? And so we started a correspondence, and this is a beautiful guy who's done independent producing for the BBC, but never made his own feature film. This is really the first for him, so he started his own company as well. So it was back and forth for some time, and um, he had no money to do this with, nor did we. And so it was a conversation mostly for some period of time, and Harold had a heart attack in 2014. After he did, I contacted Andy, and I said, Andy, if you're gonna do this film, you better come over now and do this film, because Harold was sent home on hospice at home. And he was told, we were told he had weeks to months, and this was in February of 2014. Andy hustled himself and found a ticket and paid his own way and came over in July. And three days before Andy arrived, Harold 
was sent to the emergency room with something called flash pulmonary edema where fluid fills up in your lungs. And I called Andy and I said, Andy, I know you want to take care of the Coney Island, but I got to tell you, he's just getting out of the emergency room. He's had this thing. I can't see taking him to Coney Island. We went to Harold's cardiologist and he said, Harold, do you want to go to Coney Island? Harold said, yeah, I want to go to Coney Island. Doctor said, take him to Coney Island. So Andy came, interviewed, this was 2014, interviewed Harold in our house for about two days, got in the car, went to Coney Island, rented a wheelchair, oxygen, and a nurse. So everything you see on the boardwalk there, Harold was really was standing up from his wheelchair. And by the way, his camera jammed. So the reason you don't see photos from that photo shoot is actually the camera jammed during that. It was really a tragic thing. Nonetheless, he was, Andy was able to get his footage, and it was fun. Then Harold, uh, so Andy went back. He had stuff in the can, came back in the fall and did the interviews, like with Alan, with David, and traveled around and got his nephew, and et cetera. Didn't come back to visit us at that point because he was doing other shoots. And Harold died in the following year, June 2015. So the only real live footage you see with Harold is that bit you see in our dining room and taking him to Coney Island. And the rest of it is from teaching tapes and Harold's voice of other, at other gallery, times. Gallery opening at uh, gallery, Pan Optical. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. things like that. Other things, and there was a a short that was done of Harold by an, another filmmaker, and maybe t Todd Weinstein, maybe in 2012 or 2011, and he was able to get clips from that. Um, I contributed insofar as, at a certain point, I helped to produce it only by way of saying more money was needed. We sold some prints and really gave money to Andy to help complete it. So it was done on a shoestring. Andy and I had a wonderful back and forth. I did not agree with everything Andy did. I wasn't happy with all the treatment, but I am 95% happy with the way the film turned out. Had I had my say, the only things would have, might have been different for me, I would like to have had more of Harold's sort of philosophical voice from his teaching material and, and the way he interacted with his students. Mm, yeah. um, and maybe I'll let David speak to that now a little yeah, bit. You saw it all on it. No, um, first thing I want to say is that after seeing myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my eyes fixed. Because <laughs> they're bulging out of my head. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my god. Um, that's all I learned. No, um, he, he, um, he, was, he was amazing. I mean, I, I first met him. I'll just give you a quick overview, but uh, my younger brother decided to go to Wyndham College in Vermont, Putney, Vermont, which didn't last too long. But, um, so I gave him a ride up there one day, and it was winter time, and Harold happened to be there, uh, I think just where I left Stefan off, my brother Stefan. And we got to talking, uh, and we, we talked for about, we spoke for about an hour or so, and by the time that hour was up, I was like, oh my God. You know, because at that time, my head was on backwards. I, I got released from the military. I was drafted back in the 60s. Uh, I, I was trying to find myself, and there were times when I wasn't trying to find myself. Well, Harold, Harold opened up that door for me. And so what I um, ended up doing, I, after speaking with him, I immediately ran into Wyndham College to the admissions office and I said, you know what, can I, can I register to come here and study? And they said, well, do you have any money? <laughs> and I said, well, the GI Bill. They said, all right, just go get your stuff, come back. You know, I mean, it was as simple as that. <laughs> and it's like, wow, this is pretty easy, you know. And, and so anyway, from that point on, I, I turned around, got my, got my clothing, whatever, went right back up there, found a place to live, and I st primarily studied with Harold the entire time, and he was just, I mean, he was, uh, as I said, followed the yellow brick road. The guy was incredible. I mean, he was just amazing what he could do. He was magical, and yet 
he was, everything was positive that came out of him. I mean, he, his critiques, uh, he would, we'd go out and shoot, and as he said, just keep pressing that trigger, you know, just keep going like this. And uh, suddenly it became a passion for me, and it just connected, and I, I thank Harold for where I'm at now, because without, I don't know where I'd be if it weren't for Harold. I mean, I really don't. And his teachings were amazing. I mean, they just really... And then we became very close from that point on. And we were always in contact with each other. We'd visit each other. Um, and we'd, whenever I was feeling down and out, we'd speak to, uh, we'd speak to each other on the phone. And suddenly, by the end of our conversation, I'd be laughing my <laughs> ass off. You know? I mean, Harold just had this magic to him. It was whole, his approach to life, you know? And he did have his demons, the drinking, the, well, the drugs, we all had our demons, but he had his, his drinking, what have you, but he was, he was very special. I don't know if that answered your question. You opened well, up a door. Oh, what, was what was the question? What was the question? Let me add, let me add something, something to it. As, as, an, as an interviewee here, oh. uh, and, and I guess the... the I would have two, two complaints, one larger, one smaller. I, I'm the only person in, interviewed in the film who the director asked to talk to somebody who was standing beside the camera. So I'm always looking up like this, <laughs> and, sort of, and sort of off screen, which is the third time I think I've seen the film. It's a little odd, right? Because um, uh, almost everybody else is looking eye level. But uh, I've, I've been interviewed for other films like this, and when that happens, you, you get, you talk for an hour, an hour and a half sometimes, yeah. you know, more, and you end up with maybe, maybe 60 seconds, you know, on screen. So there, there's one thing that I say in there that got cut short that I think misdirects your attention as lookers, and that is when, when we're talking about Harold's decision not to participate in the family of man, and I say that had career consequences. Because what I went on to say, which is what I would normally go on to say, is that those career consequences were relatively minor and indeterminable. Because Harold was not the only photographer who chose not to be in that show. I just, I just uh, published a, an introduction to a book by a, another photo league photographer named Leo Goldstein. Not well known, he was there at the league, at the very end of the league's history. Uh, but he, he did a documentation of Spanish Harlem in New York in 1949, 1951. Mm. And he also chose for exactly the same reasons that Harold did not to be in the show. He did not want his, his own images uh, um, edited, which didn't only mean printed by, by, uh, by Steich and, and uh, Steichen's team, but cropped and sized and positioned next to other images without his say-so. Um, so the, only, the, the implication is somehow that Steichen, therefore, malevolent Steichen, you know, got in there and did people damage who said no to him. And nothing could be further from the truth. Steichen had a lot of photography. He had the world's photographers to pick from. He had a wealth of material. Uh, Harold, Harold, Harold says eight images, but that was probably Steichen's original cut and maybe one or two. Most photographers had no more than, than, than two photographs in the show. And the, cap, the, the, the credit lines in the exhibition and in the book were tiny, tiny, tiny. And nobody I know who was not a photographer who, who knows that book, and many people know that book, can name any of the photographers in there. Maybe Ansel Adams, maybe they recognize Ansel Adams or Edward Weston, but they can't name any of the, of the others. So the career consequence was that you did not have that credit line on your resume. <coughs> Uh, and, and that to the picture editors who went through that book looking for possible people to give assignments to, your name would not come up if you did not have a picture that drew their attention. That was really it. So, so that was not what, what, what interfered in any way with Harold's future in 1953-54. Harold's move to Philadelphia and, and dropping out of the, photo, of the New York photo scene to, I mean, Philadelphia was a backwater then. 
If there's any Philadelphians here, I don't want to insult you, but it's a backwater now. From the standpoint of the photo scene. From the standpoint of the photo scene, right? Not, 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 not partially, but from the standpoint of the photo scene, right? Um, it, 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 it's not a major photo center, and New York was. But it's an hour and a half bus ride away, or train ride. Harold could have hopped on the bus or the train and come up to New York six times, six, eight times a year, and hung out at Museum of Modern, Modern I mean, he's in the collection, so being in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art means, meant anyhow back then, that you had a permanent lifetime pass to attend Museum of, Mar uh, Museum of Modern Art events, including openings. Harold could have come up for every photo opening at the Museum of Modern Art every year, and made his presence visible, and made himself visible, and hung out with people he probably knew, right? And been visible. And Harold became non-visible by moving to Philadelphia and dropping out. And that, was, that had a, the, a far more profound impact on his recognition or lack of recognition than did his decision about the family of man. So I, which I probably explained in the outtakes, you know, <laughs> of, of, that, of that little snippet. I guess we're all doing um, that. But, but, uh, it, but filmmakers make those decisions, and if you're going to do that kind of interview, you accept the fact that you don't get final cuts. Someone so. else is controlling the content. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. My understanding, they, they, David, David can, can, can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but my understanding is still that basically if you're, if you're visible in public, which means if you're standing behind the window of your apartment or home and you're visible from street level or visible by telephoto lens from a helicopter, you are fair game in the United States. Um, and no permission is required to, to, use, to use that image non-commercially. You can't use it in an advertisement of any kind. Editorial but, use. But, but editorial use or, or artistic use, you know, like exhibition use, etc., is fine here. There, there, there are countries where that's much more <coughs> strictly regulated and cultures where that's much more strictly regulated, but that's still true here. Um, and we still have probably more than ever have street photographers going around all over this country making photographs of people on the street. So you can still do it. Do people react differently? Maybe. I remember G Gary Winogrand was once asked, the guy was a very aggressive photographer, very in-your-face photographer, was once asked if he ever worried about making this goes to David's question before or concern before. Was he ever worried, you know, about, you know, making photographs of strangers out in the street and he said, I got two and a half pounds of metal and glass in my hand. <laughs> you know, so that, 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 that's one, one way of thinking about it there, and it's constellation maybe, you know. Well, it's a little uh, bit different when you go to, I bring up Cuba because of all the years I've been going there. And, <clears throat> you know, if there's somebody I see that I want to photograph, I stand way back across the street, what have you. And I don't like to come in close to people normally. Um, and so I like to, I usually like to photograph out in the streets and, and integrate, integrate the street with well, What kind of camera are you using? That's, huh? What kind of camera are you using? Small, large, medium? It's, it's small. It's, it's a equivalent to 35. It's a 35, meter. okay. Yeah. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll have, I always shoot with a wide angle lens. So it gives you a lot more space to work with. Um, and I stand way back. Actually, not way back. The streets are very narrow. 
but I also tend to stand away from the person. You have a wide angle lens. I can be back here, they could be right there, and it pushes them back. And if they see the camera pointing at them, many times they'll say, peso, peso, peso. And, you know, or don't do it. And I, I respect that. But one way of getting around that, or working around that, is to stand a little bit off to the side from them. And with a wide angle lens, they don't realize that you're photographing them. Them. Well, that they're in the picture. But yeah. see, I like to integrate the background with them. <coughs> right. That's how I, when I do people, normally right. that's what mm -hmm. I do. Right. And so it works every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, I am not one to shove my camera into people's faces. Yeah. I just won't do that. It's yeah. it, I, don't, I respect that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I wouldn't like it with me, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, there's different ways of dealing with it. So, um, film is a little, I consider a little more precious than digital because you're not sure what you're going to get in doing so many shots. I mean, did Carol have a pocket full of rolls of film? I mean, I saw the contact sheets and I saw several, ten maybe shots of the same kind of thing. I mean, how did he shoot? Did he just load another roll up and always have a roll on or what? He would take. 15, 20 rolls to Coney Island on a day when he would go. Yeah, so he was always shooting and, I mean, yes, digital allows you to go fast and quick, but Harold did that anyway. Harold would shoot, 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 shoot. So people say, God, you know, he would say, in modesty, you know, yes, this is my iconic, gorgeous photograph. It's also, there's 50 contact sheets here. In other words, you take a lot of pictures to get those yeah. few gems. Yeah. And truly, some of the contact sheets, like he would have his really hot days, which I'm meaning hot eye, like really on. You could look at some of those contact sheets and there was a winner. You know, they were all winners. You could look at others on a day and say, well, not much there. So he just took a lot of photographs. And he, oh, and he would buy the, the film that you could get uh, and roll yourself and have a, like yeah, yeah, hundred bulk, 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 bulk. Bulk. so he'd buy it in bulk yeah. because he always was broke too and he so he'd have you know those rolls that had a hundred and he shot with a half frame camera for quite some time an Olympus half frame mm -hmm. and so you get oh. 72 right. on a roll as opposed to 36 uh -huh. so uh -huh. yeah he just took a lot of pictures uh -huh. he'd take lots of film with him whenever he went and the thing with film and digital as I said earlier, is that digital, you can just, I mean, you can just delete, delete, and you can shoot, 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 and not worry about the fact that... Right, you're going to run out of film. You're yeah. going to run out of film, and right. the cost factor also. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, with film, <coughs> excuse me, I, was, I would always shoot, just keep shooting, 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 because you don't know what, you're gonna, what the final result's going to be. If an exposure is right. wrong, or this and that, and... Where digital is so easy now, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. in that re in that regard, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, <coughs> times have changed. Anyone else? I, I it was just a great film. You know, I, it really, I feel like I know the guy, and I feel like I know you guys a little bit. And it just was really a, a very intimate and. I actually have a request. This is the old fashioned please sign our mailing list request. Out on the back tables as you go out, I would love you to be on our list if you'd like our mailing, our newsletter, and anything like that. So before you go, <coughs> Please sign, give us your email address if you will and if you want to. That's the kind of thing I always forget to say, but I for just remember. <laughs>